Good evening, everyone. We are really, really blessed to have each and every one of you here join us tonight for this new extension of Chosen Program, where we pray that each one of you have come here ready to be filled with God's Word. Uh, we have a new MC for our program. It's so wonderful. A bright young spirit, a bright young man of God, uh, who directs the YCLC in Las Vegas and in Nevada, and we're so proud to have him with us as our MC for tonight. I'd like to introduce to you all Pastor Antonio Bowen. Pastor Bowen, take it over. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Such a blessing to have each and every one here on tonight during this amazing uh, chosen program. We have so much uh, great things that is in store for us. Good evening, uh, Reverend Jenkins, Mrs. Jenkins, uh, to everyone. It, we are so blessed and so uh, delighted to have each and every one of you. Again, my name is uh, Pastor Antonio Bowen. I am from the great, great city of Las Vegas, Nevada. As y'all see, I am on the patio uh, in Milwaukee, uh, Wisconsin. I'm visiting families. Uh, so I continue to just keep me in your prayer as we're doing this traveling thingy on my way home tomorrow. It's a little chilly, but not too cold. Um, so I am so, so excited about tonight and learning uh, the great stuff uh, that Reverend Compton is going to be teaching us on tonight. So with that is being said, uh, I am your YCLC um, regional uh, person for uh, Nevada, uh, and also I'm also your YCLC co-chair. So I am so, so excited about working uh, with Reverend Holmes with this new appointment and uh, just working with YCLC, WCLC all together. I am so, so uh, delighted. But with that being said, we are here at uh, 704, uh, Reverend Hernandez. So we're going to uh, get ready and get it started. Now at this time, I just want to read y'all a short little uh, bio about a mighty, uh, mighty woman of God who's going to come forth and give us this awesome, awesome prayer on tonight. And that is no other than Archbishop Starlings. Archbishop Dr. Starlings is the founder and leader of the Little Rock Zion International Archbishop, Deliverance. Archbishop Solange Lewis. Solange <laughs> Lewis. Lewis. I am so, so, so sorry, uh, Solange Lewis. I don't know where I see Starlings on tonight. I am so, so sorry. Archbishop uh, Solange, I'm so used to saying Archbishop Starlings. So, uh, Y'all know I'm a little nervous tonight. Um, but nevertheless, we, we have it uh, covered. Archbishop uh, Solange Lewis is the leader of the Little Rock Zion International Deliverance Ministry uh, as a director of uh, ACLC. Uh, Dr. Lewis is curr uh, currently serving as the co-chairwoman of the New York chapter and uh, is the ACLC National Woman in Ministry National Co-Chair and the World uh, Christian Leadership Council, WCLC, um, is a part of that amazing committee. So with nothing else being said on tonight, I want to uh, invite up uh, Archbishop Lewis uh, to give us this great prayer and uh, help us to go into this uh, great meeting. So uh, Archbishop Lewis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Reverend Bowen. I know that you are excited. I, I know that whenever I have to do something that is great like you about to do tonight, yes, you are excited. So don't worry, we wear different hats sometimes, but surely God is good. And then to our Dr. Uh, Compton, such a powerful teacher and to all that is on this platform tonight or in the presence of God and true parents, we wanna thank you for being here. So let me pray. Oh, hallelujah, Jesus. Good and gracious Father, we come before your presence one more time. We come tonight, Lord, for the launching of a new era, for the launching of a new teaching. We come tonight, Lord, not for the first time, but because we know that there are greater things ahead. 
So we thank you, God, for everything that you're doing. And we thank you, Lord, for the blueprint that our true parents, uh, Dr. Hector and Moon, uh, left behind so that we can follow the footstep. We thank you for our true father, Father Moon, who is working still in the spirit realm. Father, how we thank you for each and every one that is gathering here to hear the words tonight, to see the blueprints, to watch the dropping of the mighty uh, spiritual uh, miracle that is about to take place. We thank you, God, for all that you're doing and for your young son, oh God, that is uh, the MC for tonight. We pray that you will cover him on every bend inside. Father, we thank you. Together we must work to build God's kingdom. And that's why we are here. Together we must live. Together we must love. Together we got to walk with the unity. And so as the teaching will be going forward tonight, we pray mighty God that the Holy Ghost may spread through every ear, every heart, may receive a seed and spread it to joy at last. Father, we thank you right now and we claim and we ask for every, uh, every heads of churches that will gather here tonight, will hear a word that is coming from heaven, a word that is coming, oh God, from your kingdom. So we ask God that you take over and take full control right now in your mighty name, amen and adieu. Yeah. I do and amen. I God do. bless you, uh, amazing amen. woman of God. Wow, thank you so much for that amazing, amazing pray uh, prayer. Don't everyone feel good on tonight? Don't we? Are we excited about what God is getting ready to open our minds to? And I hope everybody on tonight is ready to receive an awesome word from God on tonight. I am excited about learning and going deeper into the divine principles with an amazing, amazing teacher, Reverend Compton. I've been in class with him myself, so uh, get ready. I, I feel like T.D. Jakes tonight, if I could quote him, he would say something like, get ready, get ready, get, uh, get ready, because you are truly uh, are going to be blessed by someone uh, great, and he is no other than Reverend Compton. Reverend Compton was born in California, February 2nd of 1953. He joined the Unification Church in California in 1971. Uh, Reverend Compton is the... Uh, from 1983 to 2000, Reverend Compton was uh, charged with uh, divine principal education in New York and became the leader of the New York City witnessing team. And 2000 and to 2002, he became the pastor of the Unification Church in Manhattan, and he served as the vice regional leader. And two. Uh, Reverend Compton also received uh, received the marriage blessing to his uh, lovely wife, Linda, uh, from Richmond, Indiana in 1982. They have four amazing, amazing children. What a blessing. In 2015, he became the National Director of Education of the Family of World Federation headquarters in New York. At the time, he moved to Las Vegas to teach the Divine Principles Seminar at the newly IPEC Conference Center. If y'all haven't been to IPEC, it's such a beautiful place. In 2021, uh, he received uh, his Doctor of Ministry uh, degree from the Unification Theology Seminary. So with nothing else being said, I'm going to turn uh, this amazing uh, meeting over and get your hearts ready, get your minds ready to receive what we're going to learn on tonight. So without nothing being else said, ladies and gentlemen, I want to present to some and introduce to others, no one other than Reverend Dr. Compton. Thank you, Pastor Antonio. Thank you for your heartfelt and enthusiastic introduction. I'm humbled. I'm humbled to be here. Uh, greetings to Dr. Rouse. And greetings to all of my brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, pastors and ministers and 
and just uh, disciples of Christ. It's really an honor to be here with you this evening. Uh, I was asked to give a presentation uh, on the divine principle. So I'm going to start off here with sharing my screen. And you should see blue. I hope you're seeing blue right now. All right, so um, I was asked to initiate a series of presentations uh, based upon the exposition of the divine principle, a diagram lecture manual. And what this is, is the divine principle, which I am holding here. The uh, divine principle is about what? Over 400 pages. It's quite condensed content. And uh, it has been taken and it is put, and put into a 12 hour lecture manual. So if you were to teach this, it takes approximately 12 hours. And it's, it was put together with diagrams. And recently Dr. Yong, the continental director for uh, North America, for the Family Federation, he's called upon blessed families and, and pastors and leaders to, to read this, not once, more than once, as a kind of offering, as a way to really bring the word of God into our lives. So that's what I was asked to do this evening is to uh, begin with the introduction of this 12 hour presentation on the exposition of the divine principle. All right, so in preparation for that, I wanted to share a few words. This is a passage from the scripture, John 16, 12 and 13. And Jesus is speaking. He says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. So as we all know, Jesus spoke the word of God. Jesus himself was the living word of God in the flesh. And we all know that it's through the word that God has worked through history to transform fallen people and to elevate us to becoming his sons and daughters. It goes way back to Abraham when God called on Abraham, spoke to Abraham, gave him guidance. Uh, 400 years later, God called on Moses, revealed to us the Ten Commandments and the laws that we find in the Old Testament era. So it's this word of God through which God uh, guided the Israelites. Uh, God worked almost 2,000 years from Abraham to prepare a place to send his son, the Messiah, to prepare the Jewish people. As we know, again and again, God called upon them to be faithful to his word, to understand God's word, and to practice God's word. This is what transforms each of us and this is what can transform our world. And this is the path by which God is working to bring his kingdom upon this earth. So when Jesus came as the living word, it was so important that the people receive the words that he spoke and put them into practice. That was the key. But as he mentions in this passage, which we just read, he says, I still have many things to say to you. So what we learn is that there were many things Jesus could not reveal or could not explain to his disciples. They just weren't able to receive it. And the path of Jesus became the path of the cross. And after his resurrection, then Jesus continued, as he promised here, he said, the spirit of truth will come, will guide you into all the truth. Okay, so I'm going to move to the next slide. And the truth that Jesus needed to convey after his resurrection was not an easy one. It was the idea that the Messiah had come to give his life as a ransom, to pay the price for sin, that we might be forgiven and that we might receive God's spirit. So 1 Corinthians 1.23, it says, We proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. So here was a truth that was so important for the New Testament age, the 2,000 years from Jesus to the present age. In order for the Christian faith to go forward, this was a crucial truth that the Messiah was crucified. 
the Jews believed the Messiah was coming to establish God's kingdom. So this was a, a radical new message, which was important that the people understand in order for the Christian faith to, to be launched. Okay? And it, it begins after uh, his resurrection, when he appears to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. So let's read Luke 24, 27, and then 32. Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he, speaking of Jesus, okay, Jesus is now talking to these two disciples on their way to Emmaus. Okay, Jesus interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? So here Jesus is beginning this revelation, this education with the word that actually he, though he was crucified, is the Christ. Even though the Jews were expecting this Messiah to come as a living Messiah who would build God's kingdom, the reality was that Jesus walked the way of the cross the path of the cross. And he had to convey this message to these two disciples and through the Holy Spirit and the, the, the letters, most especially the letters of Paul, you know, Paul expounds upon this concept that Jesus came to fulfill the law, that he was the ultimate priest, he was the ultimate offering and sacrifice to end all sacrifices and to open the way for salvation, what we call the spiritual salvation. So Jesus made this promise. He had much to share. And the huge, you know, the big news that he shared was that the Christ was crucified. And in his resurrection, uh, there then began a course, which is the course of the Christian faith, the New Testament age, of the last 2,000 years, centering upon these words of Jesus. Right? Okay. Then, it doesn't end there. It happened again when Jesus appeared to Father Moon. Back in 1935 on Easter morning, Jesus revealed more of that truth that was initiated after the resurrection. He initiated that truth again, a deeper understanding of that truth, uh, on Easter morning of 1935, when he called Father Moon. Father Moon was praying all night uh, before Easter morning with tears and with anguish, reaching out to God to understand God's will. And the key point here, what Jesus revealed to Father Moon, is that God is a God of heart. That what has not been fully understood is a relationship between God and human beings. And that understanding was revealed to Father Moon and is contained in the text, The Divine Principle. And that's where the Divine Principle comes from, this exposition of the Divine Principle, which I'm going to be going through. I'll be going through the introduction. Uh, that's where this comes from. And before I get started, I just want to say that uh, this has had such an impact on my life. Uh, I joined in 71, so it's been over 50 years since I... I've been a part of this movement. And I've seen it transform the lives of so many people. People who are deep and faithful Christians who came to realize the heart of God, the amazing heart of God. And really, you know, the fact that, that when God created man and woman, he gave us responsibility to, to stand as his sons and daughters. We all know that Jesus taught us to pray to God as our heavenly parent. But we never understood how deeply God intended for us to really be his sons and his daughters and to share in the responsibility of establishing his kingdom. Okay. So that's kind of what I think the core message of the divine principle is the human portion of responsibility and uh, how that has played the role as God has worked through history to establish his kingdom. All right. So I'm going to start here. Uh, Exposition of the Divine Principle, Diagram Manual for 12-Hour Lectures. And I'll be presenting the introduction. It takes about 15 minutes, it's not too long. And I'm just, I'm just going to be reading. So you can read along with me. 
And I believe that as we read and as we uh, share the diagrams together, that these principles that Jesus gave to us through Father Moon uh, can impact our minds and our hearts. So introduction. Right. Human striving. Everyone is struggling to attain happiness and avoid misfortune. From the commonplace affairs of individuals to the great events that shape the course of history, each is at root an expression of the human aspiration for greater happiness. How then does happiness arise? People feel joy when their desires are fulfilled. The word desire, however, is often not understood in its original sense, because in the present circumstances, our desires tend to pursue evil rather than good. The original mind is well aware that the desires pursuing evil lead to misfortune. Therefore, it repels evil desires and strives to follow goodness, even at the cost of their lives. People seek for the joy that can. Sorry, this is in the way. Enrapture the original mind. And here are three biblical examples. In Matthew 3 9, John the Baptist said to the Jews, do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Moreover, in Romans 8, uh, 2, 28 and 29, St. Paul said, For he is not a real Jew who is one outwardly, nor is true circumcision something external and physical. He is a Jew who is one inwardly, and real circumcision is a matter of the heart, spiritual and not literal. In Romans 9, 6, St. Paul mentioned, not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. They reproached those Jews who boasted that they were the chosen people. Here. Okay. Human contradiction and the fall. Within the self-same individual are two opposing inclinations. The original mind, which desires goodness, and the evil mind, which desires wickedness. They are engaged in a fierce battle, striving to accomplish two conflicting purposes. This is the human contradiction. Any being possessing such a contradiction is doomed to perish. Therefore, human beings, having acquired this contradiction, live in a state of destruction. If burdened by such a contradiction from its inception, however, human life would not have been able to arise. The contradiction, therefore, must have developed after the birth of the human race. Christianity sees this state of destruction as a result of the human fall. When we realize the fact that we have arrived at the state of self-destruction, we make desperate efforts to resolve the contradiction within by repelling the evil desires and embracing the good desires. Nevertheless, we have been unable to find the answer to the ultimate question, what is the nature of good and evil? Furthermore, we remain entirely ignorant of the answers to such questions as, what is the original mind and what is the origin of the evil mind? What is the root cause of the contradiction that brings people to ruin? To take the path to the good life the original mind seeks, we must overcome this ignorance and gain the ability to distinguish clearly between good and evil. Human ignorance. Considered from the viewpoint of the intellect, the human fall represents humanity's descent into ignorance. People are composed of two aspects internal and external, or mind and body. Likewise, the intellect consists of two aspects, internal and external. In the same way, there are two types of ignorance, internal ignorance and external ignorance. 
Internal ignorance, in religious terms, is spiritual ignorance. It is ignorance of such questions as, what is the origin of human beings? What is the purpose of life? What happens after death? Do God and the next world exist? What is the nature of good and evil? External ignorance refers to ignorance of the natural world, including the human body. It is ignorance of such issues as, what is the origin of the physical universe? What are the natural laws governing all phenomena? Human search for truth. From the dawn of history until today, human beings have ceaselessly searched for the truth with which to overcome both types of ignorance and attain knowledge. Humanity through religion has followed the path of searching for internal truth and through science has followed the path of seeking external truth. Religion and science, each in its own sphere, have been the methods of searching for truth in order to conquer ignorance and attain knowledge. Eventually, the way of religion and the way of science should be integrated and their problems resolved in one united undertaking. The two aspects of truth, internal and external, should develop in full consonance. Right? This reminds me of Jesus calling us to worship in spirit and truth, right? Only then, completely liberated from ignorance and living solely in goodness, will we enjoy eternal happiness. Two broad courses in search for solutions. We can discern two broad courses in the search for solutions to the fundamental questions of human life. In the first, People have searched within the resultant material world. Those who taught, walk this path, believing it to be the supreme way, take pride in the omnipotence of science and the material comfort it provides. Nevertheless, that alone cannot truly gratify the spiritual desires of the inner self. Complete happiness cannot be attained solely with external conditions centered on the physical self. Where is science heading? Until now, scientific research has limited itself to the external world, the world of phenomena. However, science today is entering a new phase. It is compelled to elevate its gaze to the internal and causal world of essence. The scientific world has begun to recognize that science cannot achieve its ultimate goals me. Got ahead of myself there. Without a theoretical explanation of the causal spiritual world, the internal truth. The second course of human endeavor is the attempt to answer the fundamental questions about human life by transcending the resultant world of phenomena and searching in the world of essence. Philosophies and religions which have pursued this path have made many contributions. And the philosophers, sorry, for some reason this is moving ahead. And saints and sages in history set out to pave the way of goodness. However, has any philosopher ever arrived at the knowledge that could solve humanity's deepest anguish? Has any sage ever clearly illuminated the path? Have not their teachings and philosophy, philosophies raised more unsettled questions? thus giving rise to skepticism? In Christian nations today, many citizens will not sit together with their brothers and sisters of different skin colors. This illustrates the actual situation of Christianity, which has lost much of the power to put into practice the words of Jesus and become a house of lifeless rituals. On the other hand, there is one social vice that human effort alone can never eradicate, and that is sexual immorality. Christian doctrine regards this as a cardinal sin, but today's Christian society cannot block this path of ruin down which so many people 
are rushing blindly. This is evidence that conventional Christianity stands powerless to carry on God's providence to save humanity in this present age. Reasons religious people have been unable to accomplish their mission. What is the reason that religious people, though earnestly searching for internal truth, have been unable to accomplish their God-given mission? Just as people attain perfection of character only when the mind and body are fully united, the two worlds of essence and phenomena must join in perfect harmony before the ideal world can be realized. Spiritual joy is, a com is incomplete without genuine physical happiness. Religions have despised bodily pleasures in their quest for the life eternal. However, the reality of this world and the desire for physical pleasures tenaciously grab hold of religious people, driving them into the depths of agony. The contradiction and sad end which plague the life of devotion is a principal cause for the inactivity and weakness of today's religions. Another factor fading religions to decline. Another factor has faded religions to decline. In step with the progress of science, the human intellect requires a scientific approach to understanding reality. The traditional doctrines of religions, on the other hand, are largely devoid of scientific explanation. The ultimate purpose of religion can be attained only when one first believes it in one's heart and then puts it into practice. Without first understanding, beliefs do not take hold. Understanding is the starting point of knowledge. This reminds us of the parable of the, the sower who planted seeds, right? In the end, what seed prospered were those who understood the word of God. So understanding is so critical. Today, people will not accept what is not demonstrable by the logic of science. Even internal truths demand logical and convincing explanations. Indeed, religions have been moving toward this point when their teachings could be scientifically elucidated. Need for a new truth. Religion and science setting out with a mission of dispelling the two aspects of human ignorance have seemed in the course of their development to take positions that were contradictory and irreconcilable. However, for humankind to completely overcome the two aspects of ignorance and fully realize the goodness which the original mind desires, at some point in history, there must emerge a new truth which can reconcile religion and science and resolve their problems in an integrated undertaking. It may be displeasing to religious believers, especially to Christians, to learn that a new expression of truth must appear. They believe that the scriptures they have all they have are already perfect and flawless. Certainly, truth itself is unique, eternal, immutable, and absolute. Scriptures, however, are not the truth itself, but are textbooks teaching the truth. They were given at various times in history with the spiritual and intellectual development of humankind. The depth and extent of teaching and the method of expressing the truth naturally varied according to each age. So we had the good example, for example, uh, the truth that God revealed to Moses was not of the same nature as the truth God revealed to Jesus. So we see how God has worked through history to increase our understanding of his word. Jesus indicated that God would someday reveal a new truth in John 16, 25. The same chapter we read from in the beginning, it is written, I have said this, oh, sorry.
I have said this to you in figures. The hour is coming when I shall no longer speak to you in figures, but tell you plainly of the Father. Missions of the new truth. What missions must a new truth fulfill? It must enable all people to overcome the two types of ignorance, internal and external, and fully comprehend the two types of knowledge. It should lead fallen people away from evil ways and towards the attainment of goodness, thereby enabling them to remove contradiction of good and evil. It should be able to reveal the reality and heart of God, his heart of joy at the time of creation, and his heart of striving to save them. In order for God's providence of salvation to be completely fulfilled, this new truth should first elevate the idealism of the democratic world to a new level, then use it to assimilate materialism, and finally bring humanity into a new world. This truth must be able to embrace all historical religions, ideologies and philosophies and bring complete unity among them. However, unity begins with unity between mind and body and between husband and wife. Since the purpose of truth is to realize goodness and since God is the origin of goodness, God will be the center of the world founded upon this truth. Everyone will adore and serve God as their parent and live in harmony with each other in brotherly love. The ultimate purpose of God's work of salvation is to establish the kingdom of heaven on earth. In other words, one family under God. The new truth should guide fallen people to return to their original state. To do this, it must reveal the purpose for which God created humankind and the universe and teach about the process of the restoration and its ultimate goal. It must answer questions about the human fall. The new truth must answer the following questions about the human fall. Did human beings fall by eating the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, as is written literally in the Bible? Why did God create human beings with the potential to fall? Why did he not prevent their fall? Why did God not save sinful humankind in an instant with his almighty power? And it must offer answers to deeper questions of life. If human history is the history of God's providence, it must be that God, the master of all laws, has led the long providence of restoration according to an orderly plan. Therefore, the new truth must offer answers to all of the deeper questions of life concerning the beginning of the sinful human history, course of the providence, and the consummation of history. Through this, we will recognize in every historical event traces of the heart of God as he has struggled to save fallen human beings. We must elucidate difficult issues in Christianity. The new truth should be able to elucidate many difficult issues in Christianity, including the mysterious surrounding the Holy Trinity. Was God's salvation of humanity possible only through shedding the blood of his only begotten son, Jesus, on the cross? Furthermore, what is the extent of redemption by the cross? Where, when, and how will the second advent of Jesus take place? What is the meaning of the biblical prophecy of calamities? These and other difficult riddles of the Bible couched in symbolism and metaphor must be explained by the new truth in plain language that everyone can understand. Also, divergent interpretations of the Bible have inevitably led to the division of Christianity into denominations. Only with the aid of the new truth can we bring about Christian unity, right? the unity of the body of Christ. The new truth and revelation from God. This life-giving ultimate truth, however, cannot be discovered 
through an exhaustive investigation of scriptures or scholarly texts, nor can it be invented by any human intellect. As is written in the book of Revelation, you must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Revelation 10, 11. This truth must appear as a revelation from God. God has sent one person on this earth to resolve the fundamental problems of human life and the universe. His name is Sun Myung Moon. He fought alone against millions of devils, both in the spiritual and physical worlds, and triumphed over them all. Through intimate spiritual communion with God, and by meeting with Jesus and many saints in paradise, he brought to light all the secrets of heaven. Okay, this concludes introduction. Thank you for your patience and listening. And I will stop sharing my screen. Wow, awesome, awesome job. Can we give, um, I know I don't want all of y'all to turn, to take y'all cameras off of mute and turn them on, but can we give Reverend Compton a mighty adieu and a, a hand clap on tonight for this awesome, awesome presentation that he has given us uh, by allowing us to understand a deeper uh, definition of where we are going and where we are headed in order to keep hope alive. So uh, it is such a great, great uh, feeling and a great, great movement that we had on tonight. So with uh, nothing else being said, I want to introduce uh, a friend of mine, a, a, a mentor, uh, a great, great person. His name is Reverend uh, Mark Hernandez. Reverend Mark Hernandez is the ACLC National Executive Director, uh, active in ACLC since it's founded. He oversees ACLC coordination and volunteers and give guidance and direction for the American Clergy Leadership uh, Conference. He is an active uh, mentor uh, in youth uh, to the uh, Young Clergy Leadership Council, AKA YCLC in Dallas, Texas. He supports bishops, pastors, and clergy um, and helping them with church programs and community projects. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Reverend Mark Hernandez. Reverend Hernandez, sir. Thank you so much for that very enthusiastic introduction, Pastor Antonio Bowen. You've just lifted our program to such an enthusiastic level. We can feel the Spirit of God with us, the Holy Spirit with us, because we're here young and old together all across the world. I just want to, again, thank everyone who are really faithful uh, attendees and participants of the Chosen program. Thank you. You've really hit a diamond mine today and going forward as we uh, are going to be looking at this 12-hour uh, diagrammed uh, exposition of the divine principle. It's a real scaled down as Reverend Compton said earlier, you know, almost 400 pages in the exposition of the divine principle. And obviously to take 400 pages and condense it into what would be a, a 12 hour presentation. Of course, we're not gonna do one 12 hour presentation, but we're gonna spread that presentation across many weeks. And it'll take us from tonight, tonight, which has been this opportunity to hear an introduction, an introduction and so tonight, I just want to make some comments on this introduction that we've just all heard. And again, I want to thank uh, Dr. Andrew Compton for introducing beforehand where this all comes from and how the application of this principle, the study of the principle and application of it have transformed your life. And uh, that's really the crux of it, you know, I was from the beginning to the end as we were going through this introduction, what really stood out with me was that of course, every human being, every human being is fraught with this contradiction, but we have not understood its source, the source of the contradiction within human beings, because every human being wants joy, 
Everyone, every human being wants to experience joy in their life. But as we're gathered here, as we're gathered here for this, we know that there are others choosing to do horrible things to themselves, sad things to themselves and to others. Every Sunday, while people are gathered in churches and in mosques and in temples and in synagogues, at the same time, those people are gathering there. There are other people gathering in other places, which are which really destroy the spirit. So that that it opens up with this this uh, this recognition of the contradiction and the statement that any being that inherently has that contradiction is doomed to perish. Therefore, it must have been a contradiction, not from the creator, but a contradiction that entered the human condition after our creation, after in, in, the, in the process of our own growth. So um, I was really, really moved by that. Um, I was also uh, really touched by the fact that I'm thinking, you know, as we study this, what can we do with it? You know, as you were saying, it's transformed your life. I, I have to be able to testify to it as well. Um, it's been about 49 years, more than 49 years that uh, as a young person of 19, I encountered this movement and found its content in the divine principle so compelling because I'd been asking my my Catholic uh, priests, and then I, I, I moved out of, you know, beyond Catholicism to Protestantism, and I was asking preachers and ministers, you know, why don't you challenge us young people to become Christ-like? Why don't you challenge us to live a life that would bring joy to God and to Jesus? You seemed already like, you know, like you've like you've accepted some kind of impossibility for that reality. I think it's because we, the understanding, we, you said it really clearly in the very opening, right? I have many things to tell you. Many. But in reality, right? Conventional, I like the use of that word conventional Christianity not sincere Christianity, but conventional Christianity. And some people just call that just this kind of external religion and not spirit. Conventional Christianity, right, is not connecting to the powerful heart of God, the powerful heart of Jesus. And conventional Christianity is saying, all right, we already have all the answers. When in truth, Jesus tells us we don't. He has so much more to tell us. He wishes to tell us plainly of the Father. And I believe it, it would be so plain, therefore, we could never violate one another, our brother and sister. Think, just think of worldwide Christianity. If worldwide Christianity had the, the, this newer truth, this truth that can really energize and animate one's faith into reality. How we could change this world. What could we do with this? What can we do with this new truth? I'm so excited. And I really truly believe that In the, the early Christians, they, they knew, I mean, even Jesus, Jesus, Jesus defend, had to almost defend himself by saying, I did not come to destroy the, the law and the prophets. Because new things were coming out of his mouth. And the new truth that he was, he was able to deliver. For some who were comfortable just following the law to the law's extent. What Jesus was saying was scary. 
right? He talks about, well, you, you know, we, it was said, you know, not to murder, not to kill. But I tell you, if you have animosity in your heart toward another, toward your brother, that was scary stuff. It's still scary when Jesus says, you know, it was told, you were told not to commit adultery by Mosaic law. But I tell you, if you lust with your eyes, you have already committed adultery. That was just so hard because the, the, it's, it's not within the comfortable confines of law. You know, with law, you kind of can, you can dance on the edge. You can dance on the edge of law. When we can see from Jesus' word, Jesus comes to fulfill the law, complete the law, so that the law is not law anymore. It's what it, it abides in our heart. And our behavior is, is directed by the heart, not merely by law, by what, you know, dancing on the edge, but understanding the spirit of it. Um, and we've been there. The you also, I thought that introduction was very powerful because it also talks about the factors that inhibit, you know, conventional Christianity from being powerful and being really an instrument of God. And it's because, obviously, Jesus was not able in his physical lifetime nor in his 40 days of resurrection. To completely give us that truth. That's why he promises the spirit of truth will come. The spirit of truth will come and will guide us into all the truth. We're truly, truly blessed. Um, and the ultimate purpose. I was loved, I love that you, the principle reiterates that the ultimate purpose of God's creation, the ultimate purpose of salvation and restoration is the establishment of God's kingdom of heaven on the earth, which we know is really central to the prayer that Jesus bequeathed to his disciples and to all of us. So that we can all speak to our Father, our Heavenly Father, our Heavenly Parent. And we can all pray for the realization of God's kingdom on the earth. Wow, there's, you know, <laughs> there's so much to give commentary on. But I want to respect everyone's uh, precious, precious time that they've, they've made to come here and to, uh, you know, be fed spiritually, be moved. Um, again, thank you for all your years of study of the principle, which make it come from you know, your mouth with uh, such eloquence and you really connect the dots. Uh, Reverend Compton, thank you very, very much for that. Um, it is really wonderful. We're joined by uh, clergy and, and brothers and sisters from uh, around, around the globe right now. Uh, I just thank uh, Bishop Wakas for joining us from Pakistan. God bless you, Bishop Wakas. And as we come to a conclusion, I'd like to ask, uh, I saw her making comments uh, uh, in the chat during the presentation. I'd like to invite up uh, the uh, ACLC coordinator, a co-coordinator for Connecticut uh, and up in uh, uh, and also a, a co-coordinator for um, women in ministry, Apostle Glenda Phillips Lee, uh, with whom I had the pleasure of being in Korea recently for a summit. Uh, Apostle Glenda Phillips Lee, uh, maybe offer just a, a minute or two of commentary and then close us in prayer. Praise God. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would only like to say, study to show, show yourself a proof done to God, a, a workman not being made ashamed, rightly dividing the words of truth. 
Amen. If we're going to get the essence of this teaching, we must study. Amen. And we must parallel it with the word of God. In this principle, in this word is life. Amen. And it has changed my life. Amen. It has, um, it has stretched me. It has um, changed my heart. Amen. And it has given me a desire to be more like God. Amen. Hallelujah. So we just want to pray now. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you and we praise you. We give you all the glory. We thank you for gathering or drawing us here to this place tonight to hear these truths, oh God, to, Lord, open up the part of our understanding, God, that we may desire more of you. Meet us at our point of need, oh God. You see us, you have called us, you have chosen us. Many are called, but few are chosen. But God, we are among the chosen. And Father, for that, we are grateful. We are glorified in our lives. Lord, touch our leaders, Lord God, those that have went before us, oh Father. We thank God for Reverend Sun Young Moon, his life, Lord God. We thank you for the devotion, oh God, in the heart of his wife that continues the work. And Father, we thank you for the disciples, the ministers, oh God, that have filled in the gap. And Lord, we thank you for the 172 clergy and ACLC and those that have been empowered to take this message and um, change the world. Lord, I, my heart is glad. My heart is glad. I'm full tonight, oh God, and I give you all the glory. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. 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 amen and amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you so, so much. Wow. Let's give a hand to our MC tonight, our new MC. Wow. Antonio Bowen, you did a fantastic job, Pastor Bowen. God bless you. God bless you. Wow. Wonderful. We thank you again. Uh, our ACLC co-president, Archbishop Solange Lewis, for opening us with prayer and uh, leading us, with, opening with such a powerful spirit. And again, Dr. Compton, thank you for your diligence to teach us well and open up this uh, amazing study of the 12-hour exposition of the divine principle. God bless you, everyone. Thank you so much. We'll see you for this chosen program next Monday, 8 o'clock Eastern, 5 o'clock Pacific time. God bless you all, everybody. Have a great yes, evening. Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you, Reverend Dr. Thank you. God bless God all. Bless. God bless. Hi, Dr. Patra. Hi. Thank you. God bless 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 you.